With a clap, you gonna clap? I'm okay. starting off with the clap. Yeah, let's clap. Yeah, let's clap. Let's clap. Let's we clap. never start the show off yeah, with a clap. No, no, no. We know to do a bunch of talking and then clap. But my name is Tank. I'm Jay Valentine, and this is R&B Money, the yeah. R&B Money podcast. Yes, it is. The authority. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, can nobody say shit? Can't nobody say after nothing today. about? <laughs> we are now yeah. the official authority yeah. on all things. R and I wish they would. I wish, ooh, <laughs> for boy? the love of God, boy. Wish we, they would. We have in the building, um, and I'm not gonna labor long on the intro. I'm just gonna say, the greatest singer, songwriter, producer of all times, all times, all times, Mr. Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. In Babyface the in the building. Thank you. I was like, who is y'all talking about? <laughs> you! <laughs> you know who we talking about. Yeah. You walk in here yeah. with that kind of sweater for, and not you, know who. You forgot label owner. <laughs> label. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta, it's Kick gotta, that Atlanta it's got, off. It, it's got to sound better than Kick label. Kick that Atlanta off. Mogul. Mogul. I mean. Yeah. We are. All love. We are following in giant footsteps. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And so this moment right here is like um surreal in, in real life and we've 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 had our moments and in, in our relationship yeah. for a long time but mm-hmm. um for you to come here and sit with us man we are i mean truly beyond honored well i was honored, honored to come and sit with you guys thank you brother thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. why why would not yes sir because I'm, I'm a major fan so and have been for years but you know that yes sir so it it's uh I think it's wonderful what you guys are doing and what you do and what you bring to the culture and to R&B and keeping it alive. It's, it never died in the first place. So. Yes, they're talking uh, about. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm honored to be here. I want to start off with a story and then we'll, Come on, get, story time. we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts and the nicks and crannies. Um, you called me one day hmm. and you said, Tank, I'm doing a Christmas party pretty you know pretty huge deal for some cool people and I'm going to play and sing and I'd like you to play for me and sing as well and excuse me the way I translated that to my mom was babyface just called me he said I'm the greatest <laughs> he said I'm, I'm the most special artist singer songwriter producer he's ever seen in his life and he can't do this without me. That's how I translated it. Don't, oh, man. don't worry about that. Um, and he's the baby. I'm the face. <laughs> he's the baby. I'm the face. That's basically what he said. <laughs> and that's you know that's the, that's the story I told. <laughs> and so we get into rehearsal over at the amazing studio that we should have a room in, and we should have a room there. We should definitely. Have and um, and I and. I don't know why I'm a pocket. I'm a pocket player when it comes to you know being a musician, playing piano. I'm a, I'm a pocket guy. I'm the guy that holds down the fort. It's always been my role in in a band since I was a kid. And for some reason, I just felt the need to dazzle you with my <laughs> with my piano antics and my dexterity and all of my information within the one key you had me playing in and i'm just i'm just tickling the ivory while you're you're singing and you're just kind of looking like yeah and i'm thinking it's like yeah he's killing it i'm thinking that's the look you're giving me and then finally you're like god and we said right and bah, right i do the whole thing and then you look at me you're like yeah yeah i think i think less of you more of me <laughs> And I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that, that's a, uh, it's about right. That's about, that should be. That, that's what you heard. <laughs> I don't remember that. But. That's those those that's were the real I, words. <laughs> <laughs> but even in that moment, man, it was like you know, it was school was in session pretty much, and 
We got there and we did that event, man. And I, I, I think I saw Dustin Hoffman. I was like, yeah. where are we? And I appreciate you for just even thinking of me in that moment, man, and not firing me. That, uh, you, <laughs> you, you weren't fired. Uh, there were, that night there was Warren Beatty. There was a Barbara Streisand. Uh, everybody was in that audience. And I have to tell you that, because um, I've done that a couple of times with them because I'm a friend of Carol Bear Sager. That's who we, we, wow. we did the party for. So, but I have to tell you that to this day, um, they still talk about that night that you performed and how beautiful your rendition of the Christmas song that we did. I don't even remember which Christmas song we did, yeah. but um, they still, Carol still talks about whoever that guy was, he had the most amazing voice. And I said, that's why I brought him. Because the emotion that he sings with, <clears throat> it's not just, not just moving the notes, but it's, it's how you approach it. And from, from being able to <clears throat> say, sing any word or, or, or any lyric, if the melody and the emotion's not there, then he can just write, write, you know, go right by, by you. Mm -hmm. And you did not disappoint that night. I still get brownie points from years ago from bringing you to that spot. Thank you, brother. So I appreciate so that. So a little more you. It was about you. I don't remember saying those words. More me. That's not even in my vocabulary. More me, less you. So, but that's how you heard it, I'm sure. I probably, I probably just said, maybe don't play as much. And you took it as like, oh, more no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> No, um, brother, face. You definitely said no. That's how you remember less, it. Those those words are in my vocabulary. More, more me. <laughs> we were in a very confined space. I understand. Probably, I understand, but you were no are remembering on. wrong. Oh, man. Right now. Oh, man. <laughs> more me. Let's. Uh, so, so it's again when I tell the story. He's the baby. I'm the face. It's, uh, I'm the greatest ever. Um, we 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 love to we love to start at the beginning, face. Like we yeah. love to say. Or, or love to ask, when was the first time someone said to you or that you realized that you had something special? Something special? The gift. I don't know if I ever thought of it as a gift. It's just something that you do in terms of like even just picking up a guitar and then, and then kind of singing and doing it kind of just what comes natural, not necessarily being a pianist or a guitarist, but just kind of like learning enough to play to accompany myself. Mm -hmm. um, singing in, um, <clears throat> um, in high school, like when I was in sixth grade, we had a singing group in sixth grade. Um, nobody else could sing, but she still had a group. It was like the, <laughs> <laughs> it's just me and the homies. Yeah, me and the homies. Still, Michael Trust, Teddy Gaines, and um, um, McClure, something Larry McClure, and uh, and we sung um, we sung Smokey Robinson's uh, "Saw You There" hmm. in, in front of our our um, our, our class, and um, and I'm a girl watcher. And those were two songs that we we sing right there and there. Of course, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm a girl watcher. Yeah, yeah. That's, you got to say that for the class. We tried to get Kim Cunningham to walk by when you do the whistle part. She wouldn't do that. I still remember these names. I know the names are there, but so that was the first time we stood in front of the, I stood in front of the crowd, the the class, and they thought we sucked. <clears throat> so I, I won't say that I felt like I had a gift at that point. <laughs> um, and then the second time that I remember standing in front of an actual audience was at um, my uh, brother's high school, Melvin. He he had a group at the time called the Soul Innovations, and they were um, they was a good band, and uh, they were going to do this homecoming thing. And right, uh, the Jackson Five had just come out, mm -hmm. so you had I Want You Back and Who's Loving You, and they wanted to do one of those songs, but nobody had the voice, so we had to. So Melvin brought myself and Kevin in the living room to, you know, go for who could sing. Mike's part. Yeah. Michael's part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we had to sing Who's Loving You. And Kevin sang first, and then he walked out of the room, and then I came and sang. <clears throat> and 
unbeknownst to me, I won. And I would not win with Kevin today, period, because Kevin's voice is crazy. Super high. He's a monster. Super high, crazy. Yeah. And, um, but um, I won. And so I got to go sing at the homecoming. And I got to sing Who's Loving You. And this was like, I'm, I'm in sixth grade at this point. You sing for high school girls. Huh? You sing for sing high, high school, school girls. girls. I'm scared really? to death. But, um, but I, I know they used to play I Want You Back. When I walked up to the stage, they would play I Want You Back. And I remember just being so nervous and so scared that when I hear when I would hear that and, and walking up there and I walked up there and sung the song and I, you know, people gave me love and and I can't believe that I actually did that because I was way too shy to ever think I could do anything like that. And to this for the longest time, every time I would hear I Want You Back, I get nervous again. You get nervous about it. Yeah. Yep. It's like, you know, just this thing that would tick you off, like, oh, and then your heart starts going. Yeah. <clears throat> and every now and then, if it hits me right, you could do, do the same thing. But that first time, I'm just getting on the stage. So did I feel special? I don't know that I felt special yet then either. Mm-hmm. Um, Till a couple of years later, this kid uh, named Emmanuel came up to my house, knocking on the door, asked my mom, does the kid that sound just like Michael Jackson but only better live here, live here in this house? Because he was trying to start a band. Yeah. And so the rumor was there was this kid that sung just like Michael Jackson, but only a little better, you know, and was out. And so he came to see if, you know, maybe I could join the group. Yeah. At that point, my voice had changed, you know, and I couldn't sing like Michael anymore. And uh, I went and auditioned for them, and they laughed at me because I, I didn't have the voice anymore. But I could write songs. And I had a little song that I wrote, and I started singing the song that I wrote. And then the dad came downstairs and said, "Who's that singing?" And he goes, um, "Whoever that is, y'all need to, y'all need to get him, cause he's better than all y'all." No way. So, so then I got in the group at that point. Shout at, out to the father's shout honesty. Out to the father. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta tell him sometimes. Hey son, you ain't got it. He got. He it. got. It. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can manage him. <laughs> so, but all throughout. When you sit there and ask the question, when you feel like you have a gift, I don't know that when your basic personality is, is being humble and not, not, not being about you, you don't ever think of it as a gift till, till much later mm-hmm. to where, you, where everybody recognizes what you've done and you, and you look back at it and you say, okay, you know, I thank God that I had this gift, but I wasn't walking around thinking that I had something. Mm-hmm. I just was doing what I love to do. Um, and it was, and it came natural for me to do it. And I always wanted to be better. I, I never felt like I was the best at everything. Uh, I always felt like I had to work harder to yeah. try to be, you know, to to compete with other people. But I never felt like I was like the best one in the room. Wow. So. So you're going through high school. Yeah. And are you are you making records at this time that you you know you can write you know you can sing you got the instrumentation see that's a different time that's like you know um back then when i was growing up you weren't really making records at that point you, you weren't even doing demos you had to get in a studio and that was just, that you got to get in a real studio yeah, that real was studio. that was that was different yeah it was unreal yeah, yeah. no one yeah, could, that yeah. wasn't reality to get in the studio no no yeah. you could you, you could write songs and put them on a little tape recorder you know a mm-hmm. little cassette and i had a lot of little ideas on cassettes you know, that I would do, write songs. But yeah, I was writing songs throughout high school and, you know, because I kept on falling in love and then write a song about a girl. And, and, <laughs> usually how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds, yeah. usually how it goes. Y'all, y'all, y'all know about that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. fall in love all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to always fall in love in the strip club. That was where I fell in love. I wasn't falling in love, though. I was falling, I was falling in love. love. Yeah, I was falling in love. I mean, like. So T Pain wrote your life pretty he much. He wrote my life. <laughs> Are you kidding That's me? Fair. That's fair. Um, I, would, yeah, not, I would fall in love. When does the professional call come? The professional the call. The professional call where somebody Ooh, this, be, at this a became label, your job. Somebody, you know, somewhere A <laughs> and R, somebody. Because at this point you're still in Indianapolis. Yeah. I'm in Indian I'm I'm there in Indy, but here's the thing. There were so many little things that happened that are kind of hard to believe that they happened even in that time period where where you would meet somebody or like um, I told this story once before, but when I was in eighth grade, um, I met Michael. I met the Jackson Five, mm-hmm. but I made that happen um, because they had come to town, and 
I saw them when I was in sixth grade. I saw them do that going back to Indiana concert and saw them. I, I was at that at, the, at that concert and it blew my mind. And that's when I knew that that's what I wanted to do because I could see these kids on stage doing music and it was crazy. I had a terrible seat. I was sitting in the back. I could only see their face if they spin. Other than that, <laughs> I, I missed it all. I saw afros the whole time. But it it blew me away that that they could do that. And so in my head, I thought one day I want to meet them. And so a couple of years later, this thing popped up where they were coming to town again. And I told myself, I got to meet them. And so I I saw it in the newspaper where they were coming to the state fairgrounds and the promoter's name was Charles Williams. So I looked in the phone book up every Charles Williams that I could call. And I called Charles and I put on this voice like I was a, a an adult. I used to have this, uh, I don't know if you knew this actor named Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to have a Jimmy Stewart um, impersonation. impersonation. I used to impersonate <laughs> his voice. And so I used his voice as my adult voice and called uh, called Charles and told him that, you know, my name was Mr. Clayton. I'm a journalist teacher at uh, West Lane Junior High School. And uh, uh, I heard that you have some Jackson kids, some some kind of uh, oh, You group. play like you didn't even know who they were. Oh, you did the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I told you, they're coming to town. And I, and, uh, and I wanted to know if... Uh, I, I thought it was, uh, I'm going to have a journalist class, and I want to have some kids, some of my kids, interview your kids. And he goes, he said, that's a great idea. Um, so, Mr. Clayton, so how do, I, how do I reach you? And I said, well, no, I don't want you to do it that way. I said, I have one of my students, Kenny Edmonds, I want to give you his phone number, and I want you to call him, and, and he will do the interview. I want him to do it like he's a real reporter. And he said, okay, that sounds great. So, you know, he took my number down. He hung up and he called me about five minutes at my house. I picked up the phone because if my mom had got that, I would have been in trouble. So just from lying, she just would have got me. And so um, I picked up the phone. He goes, uh, "Can you have please?" Says, "This is he." He says, "This is Charles Williams." I said, "Yes." He goes, "So I." <laughs> Uh, hey, man, you wow. <laughs> never talked to you ever in my life. I don't know who you are. Yes? Charles, 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 Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Charles, please. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, so I just talked to your teacher, Mr. Clayton. I said, Mr. Clayton, yes. He goes, yeah, I just talked to him and he talked about in you interviewing the Jackson 5. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, my God. Are you Really? He said, "Yes, this is good. This could happen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check with the, the security and check with everybody. See if we can make it happen. I'm gonna call you back in about a week and let you know whether it can happen." And uh, a week later, he called me and said, "You got an interview with the Jackson Five. And so, in eighth grade, I went down to uh, the Hilton Hotel on the 12th floor and walked in and interviewed Michael Jackson and the and the brothers were all there in the room. I, I actually walked in there in eighth grade. Wow. Couldn't believe it. So you were a scammer at 13, is what you tell uh, <laughs> Scammer, is that what you yeah. <laughs> one That's could the look. kids call it now. One could look. <laughs> <laughs> one could see <laughs> it that <laughs> way. The kids, the kids call it scamming now. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't have baby face if you don't do that. Yeah, yeah, right. You, you know what I mean? So, I, I get it. Yeah, so I, f I figured out how to get in there. And it was just to just to be in, the, in their space. And, um, and I, I couldn't even believe I did it. Um, but I did it. And... Um, it was, it was just all part of the whole journey because the thing is, what was special about Indianapolis is there was so much music around and there's so many bands. There were like a thousand bands. And so there was always someone to play with or someone, some band that you could join. And even at a very young age, in high school, uh, junior high school, we had bands. You know, that doesn't exist today yeah. whatsoever. At all. Yeah. Um, in any kind of, even when they were doing, you know, like the boys and men, where people were doing groups, we had bands. Everybody was playing, you know. Um, Somebody played the instrument. Yeah, instrument. yeah, that whole thing. Yeah. So, um, and that was, so even with that, in ninth grade, I had a band called The Elements. And we auditioned for this concert that was coming in town. That they were letting all the local bands figure out who could open up for this big concert that was coming in town, and that concert was Curtis Mayfield when he had Superfly out. Oh, Y'all kids, and we're kids, so I'm in ninth grade, and we opened up for Curtis Mayfield. I oh, played incredible. some original, playing original songs, not original songs, but playing. I think we played for once in my life, Stevie Wonder. Um, and so 
there were moments of things that would happen when we think, okay, this is it. We're going to make it. You know, and everybody in the music business have his, <clears throat> we've all experienced that. Yeah. yeah so there was, there were so many moments and so, and we so bad wanted to make it. I remember we used to, um, we'd be walking down the street and say, there'd be like a stop sign. So if everybody runs, cause if this car gets, <laughs> yes. if this, oh if God. you go, if you don't hit that stop sign before this car hits, you ain't going to never make it. The old school game. So we'd run with our life, you know, to get there. So we make it, but what did making it mean? Yeah. Hmm. Making it, at that point, meant that you, that your record was on the radio, mm -hmm. and that people knew that you, you know, that you were on it. It didn't mean buying a big house or, or getting a car or, or anything else like that, because we didn't know that you really made money at it. We just wanted to be on the radio and recognized for your recognized, art. and that was that was making it. Um, didn't know anything else about it other than just wanting to be known, have a record out, and and uh, be on the radio. So it, it was a different time there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, music didn't necessarily mean money. And that was probably probably something that we should have known. <laughs> <laughs> Would have helped later. <laughs> it always helps. <laughs> but, but there was something kind of nice about the, the innocence of it all at that point. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't about anything but the music, um, and where that's become a different thing today, I think. Oh, sure, completely different. Yeah. For sure. I literally have had to have the conversation with my son about they're not that rich, <laughs> 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 because you know it's it's this is it's part of that the promotion. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Deuce, yeah. they're showing you this so that it, they that you can help them eventually get that. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. If you can get a whole bunch of your friends to believe that this guy has a watch on that's worth three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, and it's only three of them made in the world, but he has one, right? Yeah, yeah, out in Macon, Georgia, <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> this new rap kid, right? You know what I mean? But yeah. you know, I I get it, and that's part of the promotion, and uh -huh. obviously, those things didn't exist at that point. No, and like you said, that making it was turning that radio dial and hearing your song. Yeah, so does. The elements, does that lead to the deal? No. There's so many little groups I was in. First group was Indy Five. Second was um, Gemini Eight. Gemini Eight, we performed on um, a local TV show called Clover Power, which David Letterman was the host. Oh, wow. He was the guest host. And that was like in eighth grade. Um, from there, uh, Gemini 8 to LC Soul Unlimited, then it was the Elements, and then it was Tarnished Silver, and then I joined um, Tarnished Silver. Tarnished Silver. <laughs> Tarnished Silver. Okay, all right. That, all was, right. that was the high school band. We played all the all the gigs in high school, so we went did colleges as well. Um, yeah, I didn't want to be and, Solid Gold. No. Yeah, I didn't want to. <laughs> Tarnished Silver. That's gonna kill him. <laughs> <Nah. laughs> what about this one? <laughs> we walk in unbuffed. <laughs> If we walk in unbuffed. We walk in unbuffed. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> you still the goat, though. You still the, you still the goat. You the goat. You still the goat. Goat got to come from somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, no, but Tarn said we, we did well. We, you know, from like you know, my high school years, from like 10th through um, 11th grade, you know, uh, 10th through my senior year, we played all the gigs there. Yeah. And the cool thing about when you're playing in those bands, that's the whole thing is that it's, um, it's preparing you for later. For sure. Preparing you for shows and, you know, um, and things that you, things that you think you know. Like when, we're, when we were in Tarnished Silver, we played our own original songs. We played stuff on the radio. But it was mostly, we had a school that was mostly white. So it was probably 10% black people and mostly white. So a lot of the shows that we what did. school did you go to in Indiana? North Central High School. Because my brothers went to Arlington. Yeah. We, li we lived out there for a hot second. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, um, it was some street shit going on. Yeah, North Central was not street at that time. And uh, so most of the gigs we would play when we go to colleges, we were playing like our original songs and, and playing maybe the Bee Gees and, you know, um, the blackest thing we would play would be Earth, Wind, Fire. And... Um, I remember the first time we actually played for um, 
it wasn't Arlington, but I forget something like Arlington. Mm-hmm. Uh, Czech. God, I keep, I'm forgetting the name right now. But we played for their homecoming, all black uh, school, and we went out there and pl- start playing our stuff because we always, you know, we would always be great. People, they'd be dancing. Right, right, right. You know, always the, doing the double the crowd clap. is different. Dude, yeah. The crowd was way different. Yeah. And so we got out there, started playing, and they were just looking at us like that. I remember I had one friend from Pam Brewer. She was from North Central. She was up there looking like it. She was like, oh, I feel so bad for you. Secondhand embarrassment. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was <laughs> like, and I could see that Sierra looking like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I asked so y'all sorry. to do this because we were just, they just did not care. Because as yeah. soon as we stopped playing, then they, then the, uh, they put on the record, skin tight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we go back up. <laughs> and, and then, so I remember me and Daryl had, had a conversation. He's like, we ain't black enough. We just, you know, we don't know nothing. This is terrible. And, and they and we knew the songs, but we didn't play any of those songs. Yeah. Uh, so we were like, we knew we had to start changing our game because we thought we was gonna kill them with um, Earth Wind Fire. We we played Devotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Earth Wind Fire wasn't black enough yet. So you didn't was, kill them with Devotion. No, nah, it wasn't. They wasn't ready. Yeah, yeah. Yet. Indianapolis is different. That's crazy. No, you have to be like yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to be P Funk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indianapolis you know, different. Yeah. I mean, you know that because you've been through there. But I'm just like, saying, even like, just my time for living time, there, like, it's, it, yeah, listen, like, when it's black, it's black. Not yet, not yet. Earth okay. Fire, they hadn't, until Reasons came for Birth ah. of Fire, it didn't really kick in, you know, till Reasons okay. happened. But other than that, it was like, but not like, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for us that night. Yeah. And uh, But you learned from we, that. We failed, we learned from it. And then... Um, and when you said Daryl, was this... Daryl Simmons. Daryl Simmons. Simmons. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where I'm... That's, <clears throat> Yeah. We abs- absolutely know who that is. Yeah, yeah, you just said the first name, so I'm like, wait, right. y'all in a high school band again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. So me and Daryl Simpson, and then um, in Tarnish Silver, we got this opportunity to go to this club called the In Crowd, and we opened up for this group called Manchild, and Manchild was like the funkiest group ever. And they were they look like giants, and they and they were also um, very talented. Where they played "Return to Forever," and they and they they could play um, they they could play jazz, they could play funk, they could play everything. They could play Teddy Pendergrass. It was like, let me what's that? Make love? No, that was um, OJ's, I think. Uh, so, so it was like the fifteen hundred or nothing. Right. Yes, <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they was they was killing, and we and. So we, once again, we went in there thinking that we was going to like kill it because we learned a couple more Earth, Wind, Fire songs. Um, and they were very kind to us. That audience was very kind to us. And like, I said, okay, we thought we won until Manchow came out. There was smoke. And they came out um, doing a Chaka Khan song. I'm a, I'm a woman, but they call it I'm a man child. Oh they, had, uh, oh, they was already doing the remixes. remixes. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 With their name in it. Yeah. I'm I a man child it. and I'm a motherfucker. That's what they would do. And, I was and like, that's, oh. what y'all, that's what followed up after Oh, they, they came after us and just killed us. <sighs> and I, yeah, Exactly. That's what it felt like. And <laughs> But it was a learning experience. Yeah. And it was like, okay, I got I to gotta start learning some other stuff. I got to, you know, because I, I, you know, I would play my acoustic guitar and play pretty songs and and that's kind of like that was my whole thing. And then from watching that, I said, I, I need to learn how to, you know, play some funk. I need to learn how to do do those other things. And I, because I loved it when I heard it, mm-hmm. but I just had never heard it in that way. And so um, when I finished high school, just before I graduated, I got a call to join Manchild. Really? So that funk group that I that blew me away, I actually joined that band right out of high school, and that was my learning ground for so many things um, in terms of musically, um, being able to learn so many different genres. So I would, preparing me for today and for the rest of, mm-hmm. you know, rest of my life in music, all of those things. And then out of Manchild, Manchild only lasted for a while. Then I ended up leaving Manchild and I joined this group called the Crowd Pleasers. And the Crowd Pleasers was strictly a top 40 band playing out of um, Michigan most of the time. 
And we played all these places in Michigan, just playing top 40, which was like the best, that was the best um, education I could get. Because when, when you're playing these top 40 songs nightly, you're learning how songs are supposed to feel. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you're learning, watching the crowd, what they react to, and when you hit a, hit the right kind of hook yeah, yeah. Yeah. with the verses, everything that so you... So it's helping your songwriting. It's songwriting completely. I'm able to learn so much more from that, seeing how songs actually work, in a, you know, where you're actually applying them in front of people to see it. So that was like the best learning ground. And from there, that was right after that is when I ultimately joined the deal because I had written this song, uh, Slow Jam. And Slow Jam, um, Midnight Star, I kind of had met Midnight Star before. Midnight Star wanted to record the song Slow Jam. So when I went down to kind of help them demo the song, that's when I ran into L.A. Reid for the second time. And uh, L.A., um, we met at that point, and that's when they decided that, you know, I should maybe kind of help deal. out with the, help out make some demos for the so deal. So Play Another Slow Jam is your first placement? Yes. Wow. Oh man, yeah. that's a lot of champagne. I'm, we can toast man. if we can toast to uh, playing the slow jam. That's Come on, <laughs> this time make it sweet. That's out of control. <laughs> Come on, out, man, that's out of control. That's amazing that you kick all this off with a smash. How does that work for you? Like at that time. Because obviously, like you said earlier, you didn't understand the business yet. You weren't fully doing it for that yet. When you write a record like that. When you write a record like that, you don't you still don't know whether it's a smash. And and it wasn't necessarily a single. And it was it was something that was that Midnight Star did. And and mind you, so at this point, I'm twenty something and I've been in the been in it for a while at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, was in another group, Manchild. We had a regional record out and it did okay, especially for you was the with the song. And so where we thought we were going to make it and it was going to happen, but it didn't. So you have all these points where you think it's going to happen and then bam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's a road, it's a rocky road the whole way. It's never just straight up. Um, so when, when they ultimately did the song, you didn't know what was going to happen with it. And I, I was just a writer, one of the writers on the song, because by the time I handed in, then the other people wrote on it. You know how that story goes. And so... Um, the only thing I can remember about Slow Jam is hearing from Solar Records that um, I was going to get a check. And they called me and told me that I was going to like get a check for five grand. I said, what? You actually get paid for this stuff? <laughs> you know. And I was like so excited. And I went out and got me a Sheila Toes card and got me an American Express card. And, and You just start ordering credit cards? I, yeah, I got some credit cards. <laughs> Okay. And I've never heard that. <laughs> my first money, I'm ordering me some credit cards. What'd you do with your first check? I got 10 credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> with the check? No, yeah, no, I, got the, I got the credit cards, but the problem is I spent on the credit cards before that check ever came. Because yeah. they said that check was coming. The check, that check didn't come for about eight months. <laughs> it takes a minute. Eight months? <laughs> no, they told me it was coming in. It took eight months before I got it. It should have got to me sooner than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout but out I was, to but, the sound of Los Angeles <laughs> records. <laughs> I was already, you know, so my credit was already messed up at early age, um, you know, and but I saw that there was there was that you could make, you know, some money. At yeah, it. yeah. And that was a great check at first, you know, thinking that was amazing, and and all those things that happened before, you know, they, it's it's a long journey that that gets you there, and all the all the songwriting and all the playing in the bands and all that stuff is what helps make the difference. It makes a difference in terms of even to this day for when I do a show, you know, everything I can pull on to pull from all those things to, yeah. you know, figure out if I'm in front of a crowd that's kind of funny, then I know how to work it yeah. to win them over. You got that you know, call you, that audible. You gotta work. You got you gotta call the audible. I've I've been in front of a crowd where, you know, there was some nice looking young ladies in the front and I was doing what was supposed to be my hit record <laughs> at the time, what which wasn't was a hit, but I thought it was going to be a hit. And they looked at each other and said, it's whack. <laughs> <laughs> and it was DAT taped at the time. You can't audible on the DAT. <laughs> and I still had a verse, two hooks and a bridge, and a hook to 
You should have kicked over the speaker. <laughs> hey, dog, you should have kicked over the speaker. Fort Valley State, I'm coming back to redeem myself. <laughs> yes. I got to come back to you. Yes. But, you know, a, a growing pain of learning how to figure out how to make those audibles, depending on what kind of crowd you're at. I'm a church kid. Yeah. So I'm coming from, you know. You know what, yeah. All church. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I know what to do in that space. Yeah. But now I'm, I'm thrusted into this R&B space on a Dirty South show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't win that one. He was fucked. <laughs> yeah, I didn't win yeah, that one. Was, uh, yeah. So, well, get, but you it. figured out how to win it. Oh, you, you're damn right. Yeah. Yeah, Fort and, that, and, that, State. and that road. Them two girls, I need y'all front row and center <laughs> man. when I come Leave back. Leave somebody mama alone, <laughs> man. No, no. Come on out, auntie. I want to I see you. I got audibles like a motherfucker. So you write <clears throat> Slow Jam, and then are, is, is the next batch of records, is that Sweet November and Two Occasions and... Yeah, um, shoot them up movies like those came a little bit later, but Sweet November was, um, it ended up being part of the deal second album. But I actually had written that, um, I had written that almost right out of high school, um, and before I'd even got there. So that song was sitting around for a while before mm -hmm. I actually did that, and uh, just, so that sat for a while November before I got to the deal sitting around on a cassette, yeah. Cassette, and you know, I I just remembered song. I, I didn't. I never recorded it other than just you know, just playing the piano and just kind of doing it that way because I hadn't. Uh, for some, no, I I think I did ultimately record that on my four tracks because I got really good on the four track, mm. and that's kind of like what also got me the job with the deal because I figured out how to do really good backgrounds on the four track by yourself, by myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, from bouncing and everything, and so. Uh, Jeff Cooper from Midnight Star, he asked me to come and uh, help the deal do the do the demos, and I actually had talked to L.A. before I got down there, because there was a guy named Hollywood. He was in the crowd pleasers, and Hollywood's a good keyboard player. And Hollywood had, was talking to L.A. on the phone one day, and uh, um, I had met L.A. at the Zodiac Club couple years ago, maybe a year or so before that. And this was before I was in the crowd pleasers. And when I met them, they had already done the switch over where they were already getting like, turning like the time and stuff. And so they had, and, and Prince, they had like leggings and, and makeup. And, <laughs> and they was like, they was all the way in. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow. Mickey free. Mickey free. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was Mickey free. They were a little freer than Mickey, but. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> but. But it was like, and this was in the Zodiac, and I was like, dang, they, they bold, you know? Yeah. But they had, all the girls was there, and they was like, they, they was with them. So I was like, that's pretty cool. And then I met L.A. then, and when L.A. met me, I was probably in a members-only jacket. So, you know, I had no vibe whatsoever. I was from, man, you know, I wasn't vibing anymore. So I met them, and he said, hey. And... uh but he had known, known me being in Manchild. At least he had saw me playing with Manchild. So he knew I had some talent. But when I saw them, I said, it's a great group. And then when I was in Michigan much later with Hollywood, Hollywood goes up. He's on the phone with them. And he says, listen to this. And because L.A.'s playing him some music. And it was some song called Turn It Up. Um, and it was K.O. K.O. playing a lick. I still remember the lick, and I was like, oh, my God. There wasn't no singing on it yet, but the track was just, like, just so hard. And so, like, it was, like, the time and Prince mixed together. And I was like, oh, shit, I would, I'd love to be a part of that because I'm, like, in a group the crowd pleasers, and they were cool, but they were all older guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, even at that time, they were 60-something years old, and I was, you know, so it wasn't ever going to be anything else but a top 40 band to me. And so I asked Hollywood to ask them if they need a guitar player, or if they need need somebody else, you know, to play with them. And Hollywood said he would ask. So I wasn't sure Hollywood asked because I never heard anything. Then I finally asked Hollywood. I said, "So did you ever ask L.A. if I could join the band?" And he said, "Yeah, I talked to him about that." And he said, "You can't join the band." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Cause you're not breed enough." 
And so being breed enough was, you know, having the look, having the, yeah. having the whole mm-hmm. Prince look and whole breed time. Enough. Breed enough. It was breed. Okay, breed. Because Pr- Prince had a song called The New Breed. So um, it was it was all about being breed enough. But he, they didn't know I had already gone breed. I, I breeded myself up while I was in the car. <laughs> 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 I did myself up. <laughs> And I was totally breed. I might have been more breed than them at right. that point. But they hadn't seen you. I had, I had a coat. And I, had, I had a you know coat and everything. The hair was dripping. And uh, I didn't have a Jerry curl. You know, it was it wasn't Jerry curl because Jerry curls go bad. Um, it was because Jerry curls go bad. <laughs> it's a California curl. Thank you. It was a California California curl. curl. What's the difference? The difference is with a Jerry curl, they dry up really quickly and your hair goes bad. California curl, you don't have to put as much so it doesn't look greasy. It was much smoother. That's the whole idea about California oh, curl. Man. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> And that is the difference in the S curl. <laughs> no, S curl is a whole nother thing. Oh, that's, that's a whole nother thing. thing. That's a whole nother thing. Oh. Yeah. The the um, California curl did not require as much liquids. So that's the bottom line. So it looked natural. It looked like you was born that it way. It looked like Jay? <laughs> yes. At least, <laughs> yes. At least you thought it we was natural. natural. <laughs> We was. It should be good for you to know that we was all trying to look like you. Anyway, <laughs> I'm breed, baby. You, I'm still Naturally. trying every day. I'm still trying I'm every day, baby. Breed, baby. I put Naturally. my do rag on faith. I'm gonna get these J waves. I promise you that. I'm gonna get them. Oh man, natural. So did so he, did he ever? Did he really say that to him? Yeah, he said he that did. too. So, he so said, LA really did say it was, that. Like, it was true. I wasn't okay. I wasn't breed enough. And I understood because the last time he saw me, I was in a members only jacket. Yeah. So hey, it was fair. But while Hollywood was saying that, but I'm breed now. And uh but he didn't know that. And so when I went down to Cincinnati, I was inside the booth singing uh slow jam, putting the demo down. So LA had come there because Midnight Star was producing their um, their demos to try to get them a record deal. And so I was in the booth singing, and then L.A. walked in, and he goes, so who was that in the booth? And he said, that's Kenny Edmonds. He said, Kenny Edmonds? Oh, really? He sounds good. And then I walked out, and I was so breed. He was breed. <laughs> he walked out and dripping like, breed. <laughs> well, he's breed now. And so that's when Jeff Cooper asked if I would stay of the four tracks I would do and he said can you just come down and help put demos together and uh, that's where songs like Just My Luck and um, Crazy About You I had already written those songs before you even got in the group before I had even got those those songs were already written um, um, before I at least the tracks were in the no actually like Crazy About You that was written and then uh, I got down there then D helped me finish writing them and um that's how I placed songs on the deal. So initially, I placed the songs. I wasn't in the group. When they went to get their deal um, here in L.A., I wasn't in the group. Mm-hmm. I had gone back to Michigan. I was back in the crowd pleasers. And uh, then I had gotten a call. I was there for about a month or so. And I got gotten a call from L.A. And L.A. called to say, hey, just want you to know that, you know, we got a record deal. We ended up getting a record deal. And I was like, good for y'all. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> so, <I'm> so happy. <laughs> As I hang out with the pleasers. <laughs> the crowd pleasers over that's here. So, that's amazing. Um, and, uh, and you know, well, at least I got a couple songs placed in there. You know, and I was kind of like, you know, happy. And then he said, also, one other thing. Talk to the guys. And they want to know, if you want to, we'd like you to join the group. And that's it saved my life at that point. Wow. You know, and that's when I, that's how I joined the deal. Were you singing on the demos? The dip uh no. I I was not um I might have did backgrounds, but I wasn't there to be a singer. Right. Mm-hmm. I was uh asked to join to be guitar and, and help write songs, but I was there to be a musician. Cuz Carol was the lead singer. Not a singer. Uh um the lead singer was um, was D and Carlos. D and Carlos. Carlos. Okay. Okay. D and Carlos, and that's how it was supposed to be. And I didn't sing to the second album, and that almost didn't happen because we ultimately were, were supposed to. Um, our second album was supposed to be produced by Reggie Calloway, but some things went 
wrong with their management. And, you know, Reggie. Of course, I know. Yeah. yeah. So our yeah. management and, and uh, which was Pablo Davis at the time, he was managing Midnight Star, and they had some problems, and and we got caught up in the middle of it, and so Reggie uh, decided that he was not going to produce our second album, and so we were like, what are we going to do? Then Dick Griffey called and said, you in L.A. should produce it, you know. So we were like, I don't know, but we kind of scared because we hadn't done it before. Hadn't, hadn't done it before, and, then, and this time we we in like real studios, you know, going mm -hmm. there to do it. But I'd always written these songs, and that's when I had Sweet November that I had demoed a while. And so I had actually done Sweet November, but I sent Sweet November in uh, for the Whispers. I was hoping that the Whispers would do that song. And Dick Griffey heard the demo, and he goes, why aren't the deal doing this song? Why don't y'all do this song? And uh, it goes, because we don't have anybody that can sing it. And <clears throat> he goes, well, who's singing this? Right. He said, well, Kenny's singing it. He said, well, why? Why? how come he's not singing? He said, because he's not one of the singers in the band. <laughs> he said, well, that doesn't make sense. So why ain't he singing it? Because that's, that's not it. I'll have to talk to the guys and see whether that's okay. So he said, well, you need to talk to the guys. So um, we were in Columbus, Ohio, and he had a meeting with the guys about it, whether I should sing, and they voted me not to sing. And mind you, I didn't have a problem with it because right. I wasn't trying to sing. I didn't. That was not my thing. I was, and you was good with just being in the deal I was good and playing with just guitar. Being in the deal, playing guitar and writing songs. That was, that was fine for me. Um, but Dick took a position, well, you know, if he don't sing, then y'all don't have a record deal. Ooh. So... Um, so Dick forced it and forced it so that I ultimately ended up being, having a chance to sing on the album. Some people see the future. Is that crazy? So, and he also f pushed the fact for me to be an artist in the first place. He's the one that suggested that I do a solo album. It wasn't me. I wasn't, this was not something that I was ever trying to go out to be, you know, as a solo artist. It just kind of all happened with the journey. It wasn't something that I was like... One day I, I want to be that guy, you know. Everything was always, for me, always about the song. Mm -hmm. If I could place a song, if I had to sing it, whatever, then that's fine. But I just wanted the songs to come out. So did Robert Townsend write the duck character after you then in Five Heartbeats? <laughs> <laughs> was it just about the music? Was yeah, it crumped up? Was it crumbled up papers? He messing he up messing my music. Up my <laughs> <laughs> Push him off the keyboard. Yeah, I know. Quack, quack, baby. <clears throat> so it was... That was always my thing, and I might maybe it was a security blanket, so I wouldn't have to be up in front of mm -hmm. everybody and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't be and no pressure. To it was e it yeah, was easy, no and so how I justified doing the album myself, I said, "Well, this is just I'm a songwriter first anyway. If it don't work, so what? I'll sell the song. I'm doing everything else, you know. So I could always feel like I didn't fail, you know. So, so is that? the introduction to you as a solo artist or within that same time frame, you in LA figuring out how to be partners into what becomes one of the greatest labels ever? The beginning uh, of that was, it, it was a little bit of that, but it was, the whole label idea, and I, I can't say whether LA always had it, that dream of owning a label, of being a Barry Gordy. I, I don't know that for sure. <clears throat> but I know that what gave him the confidence was that when we were doing this early stuff and placing these songs on, we start with... Everybody. Start with the whispers, and then we went to uh, Karen White, and then we had, he had Pebbles, and we had um, the boys. So, so you guys aren't in the face yet? No. So the, all these things that that's what gave us gave us the confidence, and I know that's that's what put the idea in L.A. Said, if we can do all this here, why can't we do this ourselves? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, because we had had such success with Bobby Brown and with Johnny Gill and with Pebbles and with um, all these artists that beforehand <clears throat> that were having success. Uh, the Mac Band, <clears throat> everything kind of happened before, but you, but no true ownership in it. No ownership. Just, mm -hmm. just you know, as a, as a producer or a songwriter, you know. So, it was it was that, and I think 
for L.A., not necessarily being the songwriter, he was like, let me figure this out. You know, we should have more ownership. And, and so L.A. was definitely an entrepreneur in that way, trying to figure out how do we make this so this is, this is ours, it's ours, you know. And uh, that hence came the move to Atlanta, you know, to, to try to search for that, try to make Why that Why Atlanta? We had looked at a couple places. We looked at uh, we looked at New York. Thought about New York. We thought about Houston. Um, we were in L.A. at the time, and the whole idea was that we didn't want to be um, little fish in a big, you know, in the sea. We wanted to be a big fish in a little pond, mm -hmm. and that's what uh, that's what Atlanta represented. And also, um, when we looked at what the affordability, the cost, we could, we yeah. could get nice homes. For far less, and uh, to um, you know, to start down there and, and try to figure it out down there, um, and we just we just kind of went for it. So just to touch on that, backtrack just a little bit. Did you realize that you guys were the go-to guys for big records, life-changing records? Before or um, just like as you as name it, off as it was going on as it's happening like are like you... which what record <laughs> yeah was so, there any one song so here if, the landscape was this Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were in control okay you know cooking you yeah. know so we when we first started producing we were trying to be Jimmy and Terry we imagined we were Jimmy and Terry I remember the first time we got on a f flight to come out to L A. Um, to for a producing thing, it was for Carrie Lucas, which was Dick Griffey's wife. It didn't matter that it was her. It was the fact that we was on a plane going to go produce. Mm -hmm. So we Jimmy and Terry now. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So flying coach, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was like, yeah. you know, we we rolling. We jet set us. Um, and it was the feeling of producing and, and doing something other than just yourself, but doing someone else. So our whole that whole movement at that point, it was something that we didn't know that we could really do. We were just kind of in it. Everything was, a, was um, there was a learning curve to everything that you do. Um, and you get, you, get, you get better as it goes. Initially, when we came out to L.A., which was in 85, you know, so think about it, 85, it wasn't until 87, 88 that anything started happening. So it was a couple of years here trying to play songs, I'll trying to get out. stuff done, mm -hmm. and nothing was happening. Um, I remember sitting um, at Warner Brothers, sitting for an hour, waiting for Benny Medina so that he would just listen to wow. one of the, you know, some of my tracks. And, and then the guy coming out, he's not going to be able to see you today. And after you waited? After I waited an hour, then I left and I, then I came back another day. I think I did that three times, and finally he came to listen. Then he listened, and he said, no, I don't hear anything. And uh, so I walked away. So there were so many more times of placing music that you, you know, that you that people weren't weren't taking. And some of those things were things that ultimately got placed later. Um, they might not have been all the way ready yet. Could have been tracks that were almost there, songs that were almost there, but not all the way there. You you tweak them when you get in the studio, um, and that's all stuff that you learn in the in the process. But um, that's why I, I never had an ego about somebody that if they turned the song down, you know, then you, then you'd be mad at them. Like, all right, you ain't gonna get none of my songs. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. wasn't that because I always felt like, well, probably they probably could have been better. We probably could have, you know, for some reason they it didn't hit you because we didn't do something right about it. So, um, and you feel that when you're sitting inside a room and you're listening to people, when you watch people listen to something. You hear it a lot differently than when you're listening to it by of yourself. Of course, absolutely. So, um, and that's you got to watch their body language. You got to watch everything. So that's how you produce many times as you play for other people and see how they react. And if they're not giving you the right reaction, okay, that needs. Then even if they're saying, "Yeah, I like that," nah, your body wasn't saying you liked yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nah, I got to work. Yeah, because you that. can't control yourself when it's when it's that it's record right. and you hear it. Yeah, yeah. you can't control yourself. So. so you're still going through this after writing, ultimately, and performing a smash like two occasions? You're still having to go through um, the same process? Even with two occasions, even even once you had it out, you still understand that 
it doesn't matter how big you are. Songs still have to make people, have to move people. Because they can think that you're just giving them a crap song. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing I would ever want to do is give somebody something that they're not happy with. I don't want to do it then. I'd rather not, I'd rather not work. And that's in that case, when you're giving away, giving somebody something that they don't like, it's then that's not a fun process. And sometimes you might give someone something that they might not like, but well, you should like this one. <laughs> you know, this one, this one is actually good, and yeah. especially every other people that are saying it. And there's been a couple of times there were things like that, not a lot, but a couple of times. Of course. Yeah. So. Um. Can I skip the tender lover? Is that is am I moving too fast? If I skip the tender lover, tender lover is no. the tender lover album. Can I favorite can I skip albums the, of all time? So top I five for sure. Go straight to it, um, <laughs> please. I'm a church kid. Church, and you know I'm in high school, and and the women folk are are taking a liking to me um, because I can sing. Yes, um, I'm not sure if my outfits were really lining up. Um, I wasn't breed. Yeah. I wasn't breed. I probably worked out for you then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as a church kid, girls would say, sing something. And I would sing church songs because that's all I knew. Tender Lover album drops. Yeah. And now his church kid has songs to sing. So what do you sing? I'm singing Sunshine. <laughs> I'm singing Where Would You Go? Uh, I'm singing all of it. Mm. And at this time, now my mom has bought me this synthesizer, mm. this PVD PM4. And so I'm trying to emulate all of the tracks and the feeling. I only have eight tracks, eight music tracks. <laughs> I'm trying to emulate the feeling of, of the what I hear album. of the Tender Lover album. That's my start wow. in trying uh. to figure out how to produce and write good songs. Mm -hmm. wow. So that was like my formula. Wow. What do you feel about, what did you feel about when the Tender Lover album dropped? Where were you? The Tender Lover album was, um, I did an album before that. I think it was just called Lovers. And it was all over the place, trying to figure out who who I could be as an artist, because I did because I, I didn't believe I was an artist. So I, I did the song called "I Love You, Babe," and then there was a song called "If We Try," and uh, there was a bunch of things that, uh, even a song called "Take Your Time" that probably should have been for like a new edition, a very young new edition. It was everywhere, and I hadn't figured out who Babyface is or who Babyface should be. And then on the Tender Lover album, somewhere I started to get the sense of, okay, it was a, th it was a thing of, after two occasions, it was starting to figure out, okay, so this is who they think Babyface is. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of cool, suave, and romantic. And so these are the kind of things that I can do and and probably make a, a become an artist in that way. But initially, some of those songs, like Tender Lover, initially, when I wrote it, uh, Dick Griffey tried to give it to uh, um, Lionel Richie. Hmm. And Lionel, hmm. Tur Lionel turns it down. Um, but I wrote it for Lionel Richie. And... Um, I got a lot of turn downs like that. So, fun um, fact. That's a very fun, fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, end up doing it anyway. And then it, it's no crime. I was figuring, out how could I do a, how mm. could I do a, a up tempo? <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and so that was like, I was trying to figure out that thing because I couldn't do I couldn't do any funk up tempos. Not with my voice. I had to figure out something. And um, and crime was the one that. You know that it was different. You know, on a different Who on program a diff that drum track. On the drum track, it would have been L.A. I, I would do. I would write everything first. 
uh, I'd have the drum tracks down and stuff like that. Then LA would come down and come and then add up the rest of the percussion stuff and make that happen. And Daryl Simmons was writing with you. Daryl Simmons, he, what he was writing not on everything, but some things that I, I would pull him in on. Um, most in most cases, I was like, I was the songwriter. I'd I'd start it all and then I would pull somebody in. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't know if it's a question that I need help, but just it's just you know, you, you want to write this with me? Yeah, yeah, that kind yeah. Of thing. yeah. Um, That's kind of how I get on all the songs with Tank. It's just like, you can finish them. Like, <laughs> Jay, what you hear? <laughs> hey, glad you asked, buddy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so, but, so for the most part, I would just kind of, the songs would kind of be there and then I, I kind of finish it out. And it, usually if it was co-writing, it would be Daryl that would come in and help with whether it's a melody or a lyrical idea. And that would be Daryl. And, and L.A. was strictly really about the production the music side yeah mm-hmm. production and, and with the drums and um and, and I'll give LA credit in terms of for the whole the production side because by the time him and John Gass finished mixing it oh, it took it to Gass. another level so John Gass was a bad bad boy and so that was as much as the sound no question um and so but I think that ultimately when when I think of Tender Lover, and I think about that that whole album, I mean certain songs that happen, you know, from Whip Appeal to Oof. to Sunshine to Where Will You Go, um, to Given a Chance. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. album is perfection. Mm-hmm. To me, if you don't mind me saying, <laughs> my God, in you my say. opinion, uh-huh. Uh-huh. that album is absolute perfection. There's a couple things. That no, I, 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 I have a question. I don't. I'd have to. Not me. We'd have to go through it, but, um, but I, I mean, my kind of girl. Um, they, yeah, there were good. There were things that felt good. I was at. I was at a space where I was. It was. I was trying to just make this whole feeling of love, on a whole. The whole whole album just feel like love, you know, from a happy experience to sad to whatever, and, um, and those songs were. It wasn't from personal experience or anything. It was just me just kind of getting into that whole love zone, you know. And um, from Whippapil, Whippapil being really just the idea coming because Peps mentioned Whippapil one day. I said, oh, that's a good title. And then I went and wrote it. Yeah. And because she said it, I gave her a percentage. Nice. Wonder about that, do they? Well, I gotta start. Yeah, I gotta yeah. start just throwing words out at you more. Just, just throw some <laughs> just words. Catch me in the airport. <laughs> Twinkies. <laughs> you remember that Twinkies? Remember that Twinkies song? Right? <laughs> Twinkies. I, uh, here's a question, right? Just real quick. Yes. Whip Appeal comes out. Um, I'm not sure how sexy you were before then, but when Whip Appeal comes out, <laughs> you're extremely sexy. Okay. How do you handle that? Here's the thing. I, I missed that whole section. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> How do you see? Miss- see, I was, I was around people that were blowing up like crazy. Mm-hmm. Bobby Brown. This is all the same time period. So yeah. I'm watching Bobby, who, where Bobby, we do this records on Bobby, and I'm watching Bobby, who was, you know, what, what made me interested in Bobby in the first place, because he was crazy, and I heard Bobby on the. Uh, we had met with Lil Silas. And said, so you should do yes, no question. And we we said he said you can do uh you can do the um, Bobby Brown and and, uh, and then Cheryl Dickerson. She said you should you should go meet Pebbles and you should meet um, and look at do the boys and but check out Bobby too. And uh, we were unsure about Bobby because he had that song called Girlfriend. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he he started with a sputter yeah, as a he, solo yeah. artist. Yeah, and so wasn't didn't love that song, but I remember. Riding in the car and listening to the radio, driving the car, listening to the radio, and the Bobby goes, he, he's he's on there live, and he's he ready to, he's doing girlfriend, and he goes for the note that he he wouldn't go, and he didn't get it, and then he goes, I didn't want to sing that song anyway. <laughs> on the radio. On the radio. <laughs> I said, Whoa! I love it. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I didn't want to sing that song in the first place, and so it was amazing. And I thought, yeah, we need to work with him. 
I said, I, his energy. I could felt that. I felt that energy. And so, Realness. and so, from these songs, from "Don't Be Cruel" to "Every Little Step" to "Rock With You," and <laughs> and um and Roni. Oh my um, god! Those songs, you know, they found a home with him, and we watched him go from here all to the way. Unbelievable! Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like his performing, him on stage. Nobody could touch him. Nobody to this day. I don't know that anybody still had that energy. They may be better dancers. There may be all those things, but Bobby Brown in his prime, when he's on, he was untouchable. He was the king of stages. Monster. He was, he was the king. yeah, yes. yes. And so, so to be around that, and also to be around other stars that were clearly bigger, I I felt like I was okay. You know, I didn't feel like I would. I didn't ever have that moment where I felt like that. There were moments where it started. I do remember doing Whip Appeal. We did. I did a couple of dates with with Pebs because uh, I did a duet with her, and then I do Whip Appeal right after. And I have this actually on video uh, at the time doing some Bud Fest, and so sometime in '89 doing whip appeal with this crowd I'm, and I look at that like damn I messed up I should have kept going or something because it was it was huge yeah huge. it was like and and I hadn't experienced it before except you know the only time I had seen that like it was when the when we were out with DeBarge and DeBarge was killing us nightly you know with Luther <laughs> we just died every night you know it was death <laughs> it was death, God, it, was death. It, it was I mean we only song we had at that time was body talk, and that, and that was good. But, you know, we do body talk, and then as soon as we finish, then, you know, next up is the bars. <sighs> Place be rumbling, and, and then we just had to put our heads down and walk back, you know. And, and we had never experienced that. And the first time we experienced that was when, um, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just have to tell the... The creation, this is what I believe of the creation of Babyface, what, where it happened. Okay. Um, we were doing, uh, we were on tour uh, this time. I forget who we were with, but um, at this point we had two occasions out. And we were doing body talk and we were, we were doing the tour and everything was going okay. And then um, we played Indianapolis and my wisdom teeth started acting up. And... I went to, they were like really hurting. And so I went to the um, dentist and then it says, oh, they look like impacted. So we're gonna have to take them out. So they they took out two and they said, we might as well take them all, take them all. So I ended up getting four wisdom teeth taken out. And I was like, so the next night we had a show, show two nights and they asked me to perform. I said, there's no way I can perform. So I didn't perform. And my brother Melvin took my place that night, uh, and they they did a show. And then, so the next show that we had that I could do was in New Orleans, and at the what's the big building? Superdome. Superdome. The Superdome. Everybody's there, and so and it's a big show, and I'm still messed up. I can't even when I walk it hurts, you know. And so, but we decided, you know, we can't go to the Superdome. You can't not. You need to be up there to do two occasions. So everybody, they did the whole show. And then when they got to the end, before they did two occasions, they said, look, guys, you know, um, our brother Babyface, he's been sick and he's not feeling well at all, but he didn't want to disappoint you guys. So he's going to come out here and try his best to perform for you anyway. And they give me a, give me a little bit of love. And I start, I, I put on this white suit and I walk across the stage, and I'm actually in pain at this point, walking across the stage, this shit was hurting bad. I'm like, I can barely open my mouth, so I go and I sit at the piano, and I go, boom, doom, doom, doom. The place goes crazy. I'm feeling like Elder Barge for the first time <laughs> in my life. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and I'm like, what the? And so, and then, because every time I close my eyes, yeah. I think of you. They go crazy yeah, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And we, the band, everybody in the band is at that point, they're going like, 
What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? And we do the song, the place loses it. And um, so the rest of the tour, I was sick. Um, that was the, <laughs> I wasn't, but I was sick the rest of the tour. Absolutely. I waited to the game. That was, <laughs> yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. And then everybody's like, man, nah, he needs to do the whole show. What's up? Nah. Uh, nah. We got to have this nah, moment. No, nah, no, nah, it was a moment and it kept on being a moment. And, but it was, it was what finally, um, it's, it's shed a light, put a light on baby face mm. in a different way. Um, that made it look like, okay, there's a career here. Yeah. People actually, People actually like you, you know, and they like what you do and they, they like what you bring to the table. So it became um, it became a moment that helped me figure out how to do Tinder Lover. It helped me figure out how to um, craft that for the artist babyface, that the person that didn't really want to be an artist, but little by little was figuring out how to be yeah. uh, because of, the kind of songs that I could do and songs that came natural for me to do. The biggest thing is being an artist, you got you want to do something that feels organic. And when you're doing something that's not, they figure it out and it's not going to last long. So if you can do something that's really close to you and that comes from you, then and they love it, then you have a chance of having a career and people will follow you. But the moment they moment you feel fake, then that's the moment they'll they'll probably dismiss you. Well, thank you for being an artist. <laughs> Man. Thank you for being an artist. Thank, thank that you Dennis for... for pulling out your wisdom too. <laughs> yeah, so you would have your star is born, yeah, a star is yeah. born uh, moment. The star is born. Like yeah. this is, because if that doesn't happen, like you said, you may never walk into that and, and have the yeah, confidence to do it. moments leading yeah. 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 that you never know. Yeah, I just love the fact you. that you also spoke about the journey. Yeah. And about not being an overnight success because a lot of the, the new artists don't understand what it takes to Songwriters get to and producers, where yeah. you are. Yep. Yeah. Songwriters, producers, yep. artists, like yeah. you've lived it all. Executives. Yep. I'm sure you you know what I mean, you have you have your bumps in the road as in all of those things. It's um it does happen fast for some and 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 it is some sometimes that's a blessing, but most of the time not. It's unhealthy. Because yeah. they don't they don't realize that this isn't forever yeah. you know um it, it can come and it can go mm -hmm. and um my blessing has been is that i didn't have to pin, depend on just myself as an artist but my artistry is through um writing music for other people where they could have my artist live my, my art live through them yeah so when people are singing when I hear Can We Talk, and thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> what a challenge. <laughs> what a challenge. <laughs> that, was a, that was amazing. And, and um, it, it, you know, it, it shined a light on songs that can, you know, that I had no idea that it had touched people that way, you know. And that was, a, that was the best gift you could ever give me, yeah. was sh showing, showing me that people loved something that I did like that that much. I had no idea. And so wow. when you when you're sitting and watching, you know, schools and everybody sing that sing that lyric and, and and that melody, you know, when I wrote that, I didn't think of it as being that incredible. I thought it was good. This is this is nice. This feels good, but not I don't think you know when you write one of those. I don't either. Yeah. I agree. I haven't written one you of know. those, but <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've written, you know, written some, some songs things that have done yeah, well, yeah, yeah. but yeah. that for sure, and a bunch of others, which we could really t and literally talk about for the next five days, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have just lasted and will last forever. Stand a real test of time. Yeah. Real music, real feeling, real lyrics, um, real vocals, real musicianship. Like the chords, like y'all, y'all wasn't, you weren't staying safe. There was some real stuff happening yeah. that we would use in church too. We would still. I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I went to church, but I wasn't a church boy, mm -hmm. so to say. And so, 
you're probably like the first guy that sits on this side of the room with me because everybody else we bring on here, <laughs> they full church with Tank. And I'd be like, yeah, so what y'all did in church? We get in the Bible verses. <laughs> Thank no, you, Kenny. No, no, I, I'm, I'm right on your side. I appreciate you, my brother. <laughs> I'd watch a little bit. And I'd, I'd watch and listen to the choir. And, and then, then get sleepy. Uh, well, then I go to the car and listen to the, you know, listen to the radio. Yeah. So, well, but go ahead. No, no. Let me no, go ahead. No, no. You, it's your part. <laughs> but I, I think just in general, that I, I I always played the chords I could figure out, and like I'm not the kind of uh, keyboard player where I can sit down and just start playing. I have to remind myself and go through it again, and because. I'm, it's pretty simple. I can usually figure it out. Once I start playing, then the then the muscle memory comes back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's not like I'm not really a keyboard player. I'm more of a guitar player than a keyboard player. So everything that I that I figured out, it was it was just kind of like You're I'm not I'm, a I'm, keyboard player. No, I'm not. I just playing all of that stuff you produce. No, it, it was no because I because if I was a real keyboard player, I could sit down there and play it for you right now. I'd have to sit there and figure it out again and and go again. Wow. Because I wrote, I was, I was a writer, so I was writing for for that moment to do it, and 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 even even at the time I could learn it right there, and then I'd forget it exactly of what I would do. But at the same time, what's interesting is that there are certain things like with Roni, um, the way that, that is played. Real keyboard players could not, didn't have the feel. That 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 was for this non keyboard player. Because you would either do too much or know. not enough. It's, 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 yeah, exactly. It's, 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 a little more me. A little, <laughs> a little <laughs> less <laughs> you. Okay. <laughs> if you haven't learned anything, because yeah, I, listen, I'm learn, <laughs> I'm still learning that because your your and, and, and we're gonna get to these other things real real fast. Your keyboard playing was about voicings. Yeah, it wasn't about being the best keyboard player in terms of putting 10 fingers on the keyboard. Yeah. It was about the voicings that you would choose. Like your voicings were a highlight for me before the music even started. Right. Like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's monstrous yeah. for we, you to say we you're not a keyboard sold. player. We I'm already, already in. Sold. Yeah. And we're going to play it in church. Right before offering. <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> wow. Um, your your history is vast, bro. Um, your success is, I mean, it's, it's endless. With all of that, we have a couple questions. And, yep. and, and we, we, we're not going to take up too much of your time, Mr. Face, Mr. Babyface. <laughs> but we have questions for you. Yes. First question being, top five. R&B artists, male or female, anytime. My top five? Your, Your top, top five. five. <sighs> it's very hard. Because um, it's d at different periods. When I was growing up, Here's the thing, when you're when you're a songwriter, you have people you, you choose people based off because they're songwriters, and some people just from the voices. If we're talking about voices alone, it's so hard because I know because I know so much about music everywhere. So like, um, what things that blew me? People that blew me away, James Brown, mm -hmm. blew me away because of because he could actually sing too. Yes, and and. Um, and then, of course, Stevie Wonder, that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. Donny Hathaway. Oof, yeah. um, Aretha Franklin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, clearly the best. Cle Aretha Franklin, clearly the best of all time. Um, I was able to be in a room with her and, and work with her and, and see her genius and and hear her genius and to be there and um e even when she was you know before she left us you know it was, i was i performed with her i actually did a concert with her in oakland i i, I opened up for aretha franklin wow. and i was like whoa i never saw that coming and and i opened up for her and she knew me she like 
you know, face, come on back here. I want to talk to you. And I'm like, Aretha Franklin's called me in her dressing room to talk to her. Just to, and what you want to talk to me? About? She said, I saw you up on that face. I saw you doing whip appeal. You had you had that crowd going. All right, all right. And I'm like, she just said, all right, all right, to me in my head, <laughs> you know. And then she's, and 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 then she talks to me face. Come on, I'm gonna talk to you about something. I said, so what's up? She goes, so I'm dating this guy. Come on now. And uh, I want to. I'm gonna tell you the story about him because I want to know if you think he's serious or not. So she was she was giving me this whole story, what he does and everything. Asked me, you know, so what do you think? <laughs> is this is he is he for real or not? I said I don't think he's for real. I'm gonna let you know. I'm gonna let you know. And then I talked to her another time. You know, he was right. He went <laughs> he wasn't serious, but she was already whatever eighty or you know she was she was still living yeah. Yeah. yeah and at the point she had cancer at that point but she was still living yeah. her life and and still singing and still um, just not giving up she if anybody can inspire you you know in terms of people that don't give up and and keep going Aretha Franklin there's no better story than Aretha Franklin so when I say Aretha Franklin in the top five. I put her at number one because of how she lived her life, yeah. and how she and she lived to sing, and that was it. That she it was all about. She was a queen because she was queen worthy, yeah. you know. Hmm. Um, and uh, and and everything that she did. Uh, so there was a point. If I'm if I'm being honest, there was a point where I had Whitney above her. Cause when I when I was with Whitney and Whitney was because Whitney moved me so much that's like Whitney no question, the best, but I, but I hadn't listened to the old stuff that Aretha did, mm -hmm. you know the older songs yeah and listening to young Aretha, untouchable special, nobody so then Whitney yeah. rounds out the five then yeah yeah I'm, Whitney would be five it's a great five. five, okay all right okay. <laughs> this one's gonna be tough for you. Oh man, it's gonna be tough See, for him not to name his for own. Him not to get in his own bag. <laughs> Your top five R and B songs. 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 I'm not gonna figure it in mine. Um, you can. You can. I don't want to. Okay. Okay. Um, I can only name them based off of how they hit me. And they're the top five at this moment. Yeah. You ask me tomorrow, it might be another right. top mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, when I first heard Luther Superstar, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just without hearing it, but when I heard him do it on stage and how he. How how he did that, I thought that was the one for me. Until I heard "House Is Not Home," hmm. and then I was confused <laughs> hmm. about which one it was. And ultimately, it was, which a "House Is Not a Home" is not necessarily an R and B song, but it is by the time Luther finished by it. Luther, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was the setup. Doom 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 doom. Yeah. And when he do that live, gone. Oh, they they're losing. It's a oh, rap. they're losing. It. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. Yeah. And now that was a Jerry curl. <laughs> 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 so, for Luther, house is not a home. Um, Elder Barge, time will reveal. Hmm. I heard that in Cincinnati. Uh, I heard at the same time I heard Chaka Khan, I ain't nobody. Um, and we were in a, in a club, and I never went to clubs, but I was at a club, and, and ain't nobody uh, almost got me on the dance floor. I almost did, but I never would get on the dance floor. And so at the end of it, this girl grabs me, come on. And and so all of a sudden I'm out there dancing, well, ain't nobody look like, why am I here? And then... <laughs> 
do 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 and I was like, oh shit. And the first first time I'm dancing, I'm slow dancing. Slow dancing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Hunching. Time revere- <laughs> hunching. Yeah. I didn't know what a hunching was, but uh, <laughs> I was more like this. <laughs> um Come but on, uh, you got a hunch, man. No, I didn't hunch. I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I needed <laughs> I needed young Jerry Curl back there. Uh, <laughs> Leave the young one. <laughs> um but um but that song I, I was just the chords and, and the voice and everything. I was just, I was flabbergasted. And the whole time we were doing the tour with L, I kept on trying to go up to him and tell him what that song meant. How? Yeah. yeah. How do you do that? And and um, and I I never got the chance to go up to him while he was on there because he would always, I was like, I was a hoodie on him walking really fast, making sure people like me couldn't come up and talk to him. But um, I was I was just blown away by that. And that song, to this day, every time I hear it, it still, it, it still touches me that way. Um, I can't really think of much more, to be honest. I'm just going to give you top two, because I, I can... There, there aren't songs right at the moment that I think that just kind of like blew me away. Um, like those at the at the moment, unless we're going back, even back further to where we go back to the, um, the Jackson Five, and uh, one that hit me that isn't the isn't one of the popular songs, but um, but it meant something to me then at the time, which was uh, looking through the windows, um, looking through the windows, maybe tomorrow, I think it's called maybe tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You look it up, and they like. What's that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but it, it it what hit me about that is how musical it was, and um, and you know there was always I'll be there and all the the other ones. But for me, what what I loved so much about the Jackson Five were the producers of them that they were they were taking them everywhere yeah. musically, and and that gave me ideas that I could do songs. Your freedoms Let's go beyond, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're um, this is an easy one. Top R and B, it's R and B, but it's not R and B, but it's but it's and put it, we put it in soul food because it's the best wedding summer uh, summer song, um, barbecue song. Uh, it's just the best black. Celebrate, celebratory song ever. No, not celebration from Cool in the Game, but um, September. September. Oof. It's it's Oof. like a perfect song. Yeah. And, and I think I copied that song a million times. I must have written that song so many times back in the day where I copied it and wrote me, you know, a few September songs, just trying to get that feel. That yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what is that? Three. It's four. That's four. That's four. Four. Good. Um. I think uh I'm trying to pick a funk song. One of the funkiest songs that um not not with P Funk, but with Cameo. Um uh, I can't even think of it. I only know the lick. Cause I like what you do to me. What song is that? I know the song. I can't think of the name. Somebody will let us know. Oh, they're going to eat us up on that. They're going to eat us up on the internet. They're going to eat us up. But I can't think of a title of it right now either. It feels like it starts with a K. But... um. But funkiness, you know, just when I saw Cameo, first time I saw Cameo and and for for a funk group, they were just the funkiest group ever and they used to they, they walked like they intimidated you. You know, they, right, they were very aggressive. They were mean oh, funk. Yeah, they very walk, aggressive. Yeah. You yeah. know, they walk into yeah. the yeah. walk into the it arena was, with like they was wearing athletic cups over their pants, man. It's different. <laughs> and this was <laughs> different. These guys, these guys are different. 
and and but they carried it, you know, and yeah. and so like, and you didn't want to play a show with them because because they they kill, you know, um, and and that was, so you know, for me coming from that world and learning it, it was um, it's something that I, I respected. So ask me again tomorrow to be a different tough fight. Yeah, okay, fair. Um, we're 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 gonna build your R and B singer. Called it R and B Voltron. Where do you get the vocals, the performance style, the styling, and the heart, the passion? Who do you get your vocals from for this artist? I don't understand what you're saying. So <laughs> out of all the vocalists you know, uh -huh. all the vocalists you've heard, whose vocal would you use to build the perfect R&B singer? You pick one. Gonna be a combination? You baby face, man. You, but yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. We're not fighting you on nothing. Mm -hmm. Usually I'll be over here going crazy on I'm people. Trying to make sure <laughs> you observe the rules. <laughs> my God. You know. Um That's still not it's just easy. Somebody um Mm. I don't know. That's a very hard one to pick because there's a lot of people in terms of today, even with kids today, that voice some voices that I love, some voices that I think are, are great, not really blowing smoke, but you have a great voice tank. Uh, you, you have a smoothness um, to your voice. I love the, well, love the smoothness of it. Um, I think... Sometimes I think range is important, but then, then not always, because mm -hmm. it depends on how you use it. Um, I I love um, I'm putting all these voices together, but I love Daniel Caesar's voice. Cold. I, I love. He cold. Uh, um, he's cold. He different. Huh? He different. He, yeah, and. And he's his own. He's his own different. Right in there too. You yeah. know. Um, yeah. So, and and I, I I wonder where he gets what he where that happened for him. Mm -hmm. um, I love the uniqueness of of Giveon, of of his voice. I think there's something that's not it's not traditional. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm into this. He's like a he's like a he's like an of the new evolution of Keith Staten. Yes. This it, new, um, almost a little jazzy in yeah. there, mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. you know. Yeah, with it's uh, there's he can move, but yes. very, but but very identifiable and, and, and identifiable. Oh, like these guys are right. extremely. <laughs> it's yeah. got an egg in his mouth. <laughs> right. oh. yeah, a little bit of egg, a little bit of water. A little bit of Kermit. Oh, Miss Piggy. But but it's mean. But, but <clears throat> emotional, for sure. So I'm, I lean towards voices that are emotional. Got you. Um, I'm not so. I used to be really into the movement of how much you can do that, but I don't know that that's as important anymore. It used to impress me, but it's not what I look for at this point. I look for emotion. I look for even if it's a holding a note and if it's a crack at the right place, that there's something that we, where it delivers this. The main thing that we want that, that I think that we need is just emotion. Um, so that you can sing something that that connects, and it's not about um, it's not about so much about church anymore. Because I used to me hands down, if you, church, if you could go, mm -hmm. like, so that's for that's for thing. I know I'm jumping around and moving around like that, but one voice I've always said I wanted. If I had that voice, uh, if I had that voice, I'd be a, a, a hell of a R and B dude. If I had BB Wine's voice. You know, he can sell anything. Huh? PB is college. Yeah, yeah, if, I, if, if I had his voice, like, yeah, it's like, I used to say that to Johnny. If I had your voice, boy, things, like, <laughs> things I know what to do. If you only knew what you could do, you know. Um, but it's a little hard for me to build the the R and B singer that you want because because I'm everywhere. You know, I'm not. Cause who, got, who got the style? Whose performance style do you? Performance style. Performance style. When you look on stage, who, who is that? 
today a lot of the art in terms of R&B is it's it's more about the females. They're the ones that that have this flavor. Yeah, they're cooking us. Yeah. Um, you know, from from uh, Jasmine to mm -hmm. to Summer to to a lot of the girls that I worked with on this album for um, Girls Night Out. Talk um, about it. Yeah. It is like um, people that I was surprised with because I didn't know. So Rika had introduced me to a lot of these girls that I wasn't really aware of, and like one of them being Tiana Major Nine. Oh, we love her. And we love her. I, I, I had no idea yeah. that she had. Yeah, Collide that. is one of the. All of it. Oh, my God. Her presence. Yes. Oh, my yeah. God, in her vocal. And she, I, I had no idea. And when, when we got her in, she started saying, I said, Whoa, yeah. wait a minute, you, you real. You know, and then um, another pleasant surprise. I mean, look, we had Ari Lennox. Come on now. Special. What can I say? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Queen. I call her the queen. Kehlani has always the most recognizable, just feel good shit. <laughs> Period. She just she's she just lands what she, what she lands, and I love the career that she's built for herself. She don't care about what she nobody else, but what she does and how she rose. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. And, and she's selling out places everywhere, and I yep. love that. I yep. love that. She don't care about radio. She ain't got to care about radio because the fans love her, and People, they. That's know, very pure. Yeah. You know, so very pure. Um, another voice, somebody that, that threw me, that didn't throw me, but I was just so impressed, was Coco Jones. Oh, Coco, Coco Jones it. is tough. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. Coco we got so, a, yeah. She does a song Simple on the album. It was, ooh, ain't nothing simple about that. Um, so so I, I feel like for this record that I've worked on and these artists that I've been working with, I've been... I've been inspired to see that these young girls they can sing, mm -hmm. and they're also very independent in the sense that they like to. Uh, when when we worked on this record, we wrote this together. It wasn't like XL, um, where I wrote everything, handed it over. We wrote it all together. So we have one day uh, to sing it, uh, to write it, and sing it on this whole album, and and so everybody came to the table, and we and we only did it if we did it together. And so it was. Um, it was impressive to see their independence, and see um, independence in the sense like they it had to be had to mean something to them. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't just going to sing anything that you gave to them, um, and they had a you know had an opinion, and that wasn't always the case before. In in all the years I've been doing it, somebody they just whatever you got, just whatever give it to got, you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's cool. But it's always nice when someone is invested in it, and uh, and they kind of know themselves. And I think that's there. There was the, the surprise is that most of these art, all the artists, they did know themselves. It's different when you get with one that wants to be something but is not that. Mm -hmm. But they actually knew themselves. So it made the process easier in yeah. that sense, you know. To get so the that. name of the album is Girls Night Out. Girls Night Out. That's dope. Uh -huh. So you're gonna do a male version for the guys too? You're gonna the, do a series? Come on, man! You gotta, don't don't leave the young fellas out. <laughs> Tap in with the young fellas. The young, the young, young old fellas, fella right there. <laughs> <laughs> we available. <laughs> we available. <laughs> it's some. It's something that I, you know. I'll, I'll consider. We'll see. We'll see with this rose. I, I had a, had a good time doing this, and it was fun to, as I say, work with these girls. And I, I've always. Traditionally, just work better with the women. Women, yeah. No, you have um, amazing success with women. So, but um, don't forget about Bobby Brown well, and no, Tabby Campbell. Yeah, I mean, it's, it happened. <laughs> yeah, it happened. It happened. It happened. <laughs> it happened. They were there. There was boys. <laughs> there was boys to men. Hey man, boys to men was around. I guess they were the end of the road. Hey man, can you <laughs> go ahead and do another challenge to make him do the album with the young fellas too, you. man? Come. I got you. Tank. Yeah. Start kick, some shit, kick man. Kick himself tomorrow. You know, this guy likes, he likes <laughs> to go on the internet. Oh, he's going to. <laughs> he, like, he likes to go on the internet. Start yeah, some yeah. shit tomorrow. <laughs> um, you, you messed up my whole Voltron. You just, it's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, no, you, you, you talked about all the things I wanted to talk about. Oh. You're putting so many artists in. <laughs> I okay. talk a lot sometimes. No, no, it's all well, good. I, I, I love it. We, we, needed, we needed that. What the hell the Voltron. But speaking <laughs> of, 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 you know. What we got, Valentine? What we got? We got a segment of the show. Mm -hmm. For Brother Face. Come on. It's called I Ain't Saying No Name. I Ain't Saying No Name. And we need a baby face version. 
gotta have. Because we've had today, we've had all versions of, of 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 our questions and our, you know what I mean, and our list. Babyface, go, we know you. We you gonna give us your versions. You're going to remix all of our stuff, man. <laughs> Even though on the verses you said you didn't do remixes, that wasn't your thing. Because, you know, you baby face, you ain't got to do remixes. That was a stunt, too. I like how it was you a great stunt. I was at the house cracking up. <laughs> oh, so we're doing remixes. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, my God. That's a great stunt. I can't say that to Teddy Riley. So did y'all, do y'all think I was, like, really going after him? I, well, I know you, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't. You were, <laughs> okay. You were touching him. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Was it? It sound was, was jabs, though. It, sound it was wasn't bad. like it wasn't full left hooks. Yeah. Okay, what's the but first jab? Jabs. What's the first jab y'all think I did? To me, the jab, it's, like I said, that's the jab for me. Is that like remix? Oh, I'm babyface. I, I mean, you didn't oh. even have to say the full thing, but it's like yeah. we knew what it was. I have, I have, I have originals. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, honest to God, because you, you kind of didn't do that, bro. It wasn't me. No. <laughs> 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 It wasn't meant that way. It was like, because when he, it felt like he, the rules changed suddenly because when he played the one song that was a remix, that wasn't something he produced. I was like, are we doing remixes? Because I was thinking, all right, but that's Jimmy and Terry. So, and then I said, yeah, well, that's, I don't do remixes. So I don't know if that, but that came off like I was like, I don't even do remixes. Yeah, it, yeah. Or no, no, it came off like, I don't need to do remixes. Right. Well, and that was not what it, it was, an honest answer. I don't do remixes because I didn't do remixes. Yeah, it was it was but, the back to the less you, more me comment that you didn't say the tank. <laughs> it's, it's, listen, man, you got your way of pouring champagne. <laughs> I've, that brand is way wall. Yeah, the wall champagne of, on the wall. Of inspiration is yeah, what I'll call champagne it. Champagne on the wall. All right. You got your way of pouring champagne. I'm just going to stop with you, all right? So, <laughs> I ain't there was no, no harm in anyway. <laughs> all right. So this so, is baby faces. I ain't, ain't saying no names. names. <laughs> I ain't saying no names. God, I could. The story can be funny or fucked up or funny and fucked up. Just can't say their names. Um, so somebody tore up. You can. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. You can. Rika telling me you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, I heard somebody tore up a hotel room because I left a message to say congrats. And because they left that, because I left that message to say congrats, the person tore up the room because they thought something was going on with that someone. Oh, you left a congratulations to somebody getting married. No. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. You said no, don't say no names. Them congratulations is different oh, from successful man, I, men. I wish Babyface would wish me a congratulations on my whatever. Because he don't want to tell us what the whatever is. Hey, girl. Wish your how woman. How you know him? Wish your woman. Hey, uh, you know, sorry we didn't work w out. Was Tinder love uh, around at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't work out. Looks I, like you really found love. I, I, I yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> it just wasn't just a congratulations. We know. Mm -hmm. It was a congrats. That's all. It, was. it should have been us, but I just want to let you know. <laughs> uh, I'll always love you, and if you ever need a home, if you ever need a home, I have plenty. <laughs> where would you go? You would come to me, cause I've always thought you were my sunshine. You remember the Whipperfield, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Signed, the tender lover. The tender lover. <laughs> 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 P.S. Don't forget about those two occasions. <laughs> now, that, now that we've come to the end of the road here. Uh, <laughs> now that we've come what? to the end of the road. Oh, my God. It's too we much. Could, we could go all night. It's too much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, man, um, uh, one of the biggest inspirations for me in my career, um, from singing, songwriting, to producing, and now to us building a label, um, 
in taking those steps. We are, like I said, we are following in some big footsteps. Yeah. And we are, we are doing our best to make you proud. Doing you've already, our best. You are, you've already made me proud, so. No, no, and we just, and it, you coming here and being on the podcast for both of us is just, like I said, this is a full circle moment. You might not even know it, but you're the first person that I worked with when I came here. Yeah. Obviously, you know, I was working with Damon Thomas and yeah. you know what I mean? But like as far as like an artist, producer, writer, just the whole thing. And I never had a chance to tell you back then. I'm young and I'm just, you know, boisterous and the whole thing. But you've been my favorite artist since I was a little kid. Uh -huh. Thank you. I had a natural crack in my voice, so I'm like, oh, you do yeah. the baby face Sound all like the baby time. Face, baby. You know what I mean? I'm a, <laughs> always doing I'm the baby my, face. I'm going to go to my boss. You yeah, know what I mean? new song where you're trying to do the baby face. Yeah. Doing the baby face on a new song. <laughs> but you coming here today, it means the world to us, man. Huh. Because we truly celebrate people who have inspired us and people who have continued to do it. Just like you said with the, uh, your conversation with Aretha Franklin. Us seeing you still have a, a putting out more projects. You don't got to put out nothing. You, you can do whatever you want. You've earned that in this in this life and in this business. Mm. Your success has put you in a position to do whatever you want. But the fact that you will still give back yeah. to the culture, yeah, and still make these albums and still. Tap I know in. you don't like to say this, but give us your gift. That means the world to us, man. Yep. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tank. I'm Jay Valentine. And this has been, um, in my opinion, the, the most special R&B Money podcast yeah. episode yeah. to date. Um, I love everybody who's been on, but the God is here. So, man, <laughs> let's baby make some face. noise for yeah. Kenneth Babyface Evans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>